Welcome to everybody who's joining. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jill Bowden, and I'm a researcher with RHEL Midwest, the Regional Educational Laboratory. Today we are going to be presenting a webinar entitled Strategies to Support Evidence Use in Education. We're really excited to share with you all of the research and practitioners that we have here today for the webinar. Next slide. So before we get started, I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of a brief overview of how to use the Zoom platform. So if you aren't connected to audio, you can click the icon, the headphone icon to join audio, and you'll find that icon in the Zoom toolbar. You can also dial in to the phone line or listen through the computer audio. Sometimes the phone actually has better audio, so I recommend that. Uh, to participate via chat, you can click on the icon of chat. You can introduce yourselves, list your name and organization, and you can also use that chat box to ask any questions that you might have for the presenters or to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties. And finally, I wanted to point out that there is closed captioning available for this webinar. So you can view that closed captioning by clicking on that icon for closed caption. Next slide. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to our presenters for today. We are joined today by Alan Daly, Kara Finnegan, Jamie Singer. Alan and Kara are both uh, professors. Alan is the director of the Joint Doctoral Program in Educational Leadership at University of California, San Diego. And Dr. Finnegan is the director of the Educational Policy Program at University of Rochester. Jamie Singer is a senior technical assistance consultant for RHEL Midwest. Next slide. We are also joined by the following presenters, Liz Davis of RHEL Midwest. Heather Bouton of the Ohio Department of Education. She's the Director of Research, Evaluation, and Advanced Analytics. Dr. Melissa Weber-Meyer, who's the Early Literacy Administrator for Ohio Department of Education. And then there's a picture there of me. I'm also with RHEL Midwest. Next slide. So just to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, here is a look at our agenda. We're going to start by sharing some research on increasing information uptake, and then we'll have our practitioners talk about strategies to support evidence use in practice, and that'll be followed by a panel discussion on Ohio evidence-based intervention clearinghouse coaching. And we'll conclude today with a Q&A session. Next slide. Before we launch into the presentations for today, I wanted to give everyone an overview of what the Regional Educational Laboratory Program is. There are 10 federally funded centers spread out throughout the United States, and these centers are charged with the mission of boosting the capacity of policymakers and practitioners in our region, in the state and local education agencies to interpret and use data, particularly to make data-informed decisions. So we work with stakeholders in our regions to do a variety of things, including applied research, but also technical assistance in the form of coaching or training, and uh, engagement, which is bringing research findings to practitioners so that they can keep abreast of the most recent research. Next slide. As part of RHEL Midwest, we have a number of collaborative research partnerships. In particular, we have five research alliances, and the alliance that's highlighted there in yellow is the Midwest Alliance to Improve Knowledge Utilization. This is one of our alliances that brings practitioners and policymakers together in the Midwestern region to share best practices for using evidence and for using research. And this webinar is put on today on behalf of that alliance. So next slide. 
Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Alan Daly and Kara Finnegan to present. Hi. Alan, do you want to get us started? Yeah, good. So let's see. Look, we're going to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, because I know we're broadcasting all over the place. So uh, it's a real pleasure to have everybody here and uh, to be a part of this. So thanks to the Realm Midwest. Uh, my name is Alan Daly. I'm at the University of California, San Diego, and I'm pleased to be joined by my fabulous partner. Well, let introduce herself. Hi, I'm Kara Finnegan, and I'm at the University of Rochester. So Kara and I have the uh, privilege of being the opening band for this uh, great concert you're about to hear. And we're going to talk a little bit about our work, which has to do with the acquisition, use, and diffusion of evidence in educational systems. So uh, you, if, you all, if you didn't sign up to hear about this evidence bit, then this is your chance. Um, so the first slide uh, that we have here, uh, we're waiting for control to come over. There we go. Okay, excellent. So the first slide that you see is sort of just uh, what Karen and I do, and most people finish up their papers, they pop a bottle of champagne or do something like this. Karen and I create word clouds over the stuff that we uh, publish. And this is from a recent paper to show you that we're really focused on this idea about evidence. And while we're focused on this idea about evidence, we're also thinking about things around uh, networks and data and how information and knowledge moves in the system. And that's really what we're gonna talk about today. And so the next slide. The next slide is how we think about our work. So you've heard a little bit about the area we play, but the most important thing about our work, and I think the work that you're gonna hear about across all the panelists today, is this idea about making the hippos dance. So when we talk about that, what we mean is that oftentimes, particularly in research, we're creating these big ideas which are really important, but often they kind of lumber about or they swim around in the water and they don't really make their way to uh, practice or to policy. So the real trick here is how do we take those ideas and how do we help them dance to move into practice and to policy? And at the heart of this work is this idea about the intersections between research and the movement of evidence as it goes into practice and policy. And I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the uh, work that this is based upon that we're talking about today. Alan and I have been working together for about 10 years now. Uh, we've been studying several systems across the country, four districts in particular, and when we uh, gather data, we do it at both the school level and the, and the whole district level. So that involves central office and schools, teachers and leaders. We've ended up having about a thousand people involved across our survey and our interviews in these different sites. And we're very grateful for um, the foundation support we've had from WT Grant and the Spencer Foundation. Next slide. Um, we've used both case study data and uh, survey analysis in this work. And that involves in each district, we look at both high performing and low performing schools to try to see any patterns of differences in the networks that we're looking at and also the entire system. Mostly we think about this as leaders within the system. So thinking about principals and central office staff as a system of leaders. And we've done in the case study work, we have interviews and observations and document review that comprise that work. And then in the survey work, next slide, we have both um, the different levels I mentioned in terms of school and leadership and central office as well as we have both our network data and we have other data that we gather that helps us with analysis around the organizational learning, climate and culture, as well as research evidence and use. So over time, we've had uh, data in all of these districts, multiple time points, both qualitative and quantitative. And that allows us both to look at the universe of people in those systems, but also to do a matched analysis of people who remain in the system over a four year period. And we have high response rates. So that allows us to have high quality data to share with you. 
And so we have, uh, as you can see, we have a quite an enormous amount of data that would take a heck of a long time to go through and talk about. We're just going to take a small slice and privilege some of what we've been really finding in our work that's really important. And that's this idea about relationships. And so what we've been noticing around evidence in our work is that um, it moves through people. And this is sort of the classic picture of that famous game telephone, where somebody whispers something into somebody else's ear, and then it goes through this whole chain of interactions and networks. And finally, the message becomes really different when it gets to the very end. So the idea is that as evidence moves through people, it gets changed, modified, filtered in some ways. And that process, that social process is a really important one for us to pay attention to. And the way that we do that primarily in this particular work, which we're privileging today, is through this idea called social networks. And social networks are very interested in the sets of interactions that happen between and among people. And so Karen and I create these really interesting looking maps to try to understand the social structure. So in this particular example, you see a couple of key actors, Hamlet and Claudius. This happens to be a friendship uh, network. And each one of the dots represents a main player in the system, and the lines represent the connections between them. And when you see nodes, these little dots that are bigger, that means that they have more resources that are flowing to them. So now let's take a look at some actual data from a school. And so Kara will show us some data we've collected recently. Yes, as, as Alan suggests, Hamlet wasn't in our study, but here is a school that was included. Um, and now this is data that you're looking at that the the yellow or the black nodes, the black just means we were missing some attribute information, but those were teachers and the orange nodes are administrators within a school. And what you see here is, is that was a question about who do you turn to for evidence you use in your practice. And you can see on this slide that most of the people, this is the direction of the arrows, are turning to that one central node that's orange. And there are some other connections across, but mostly this would be considered a very centralized network. You also see some dots on the side, if we actually, if we could go back for a sec, the um, dots on the side are a, a really important thing. That's not a mistake. Those are people who are in this school who are not connected to anyone in the network. So they don't turn to anyone for research they use in their practice and nobody turns to them, or research evidence, I should say. Also, one thing that's important, one last thing about this slide is that the principal ended up leaving in the following year. And so you can see when something is so centralized that it disrupts the entire network. And so there, there just wouldn't be this movement of evidence in this school anymore once this central person left. Now the next slide. This is another um, set of data from our, a district level set of data in terms of the leadership, what we call the leadership network, the principals and central office. So here you see the blue nodes are principals, the red are central office, and again you have people on the side who aren't connected at all around evidence use. And one of the other pieces that we have done in our work is look at the lowest performing schools in the system. So the square, the blue squares, are the principals at the low performing schools. And this was actually really important for us understanding that even when, so you don't see a lot of connectedness, particularly across these two groups, the principal and central office leaders, but especially within the group of low performing schools, it's, they are le less likely to be connected into the evidence that's flowing throughout this district. And so that would be something that would be a concern in the district in terms of how ideas and practices flow to the principals in those schools. Excellent. So the other part to our work is, so you could sort of think that's the quantity of relationships, right? The sets of interactions that are happening between people. But the other part of our work is really interested in the quality of these relationships. And one of the things that we find in our work uh, consistently is the role of trust and high quality relationships in moving evidence. So for folks that have these stronger trust ties, which we'll circle around to a little bit later, they're able to share evidence at a really a much deeper level. And so we can also think about this work over time. So this particular map that you're looking at, you've got two networks that are shown at time point one and time point two. And so it's the same uh, color coordination that uh, Kara was sharing before, with the red being central office actors, the blue being principals. And you could see this is about affective ties or trust ties. And you can see this district we collected it, data at time point one. You can see essentially 
there's sort of the system is broken into two. You've got the sort of red group of central office actors interacting. You've got the blue group of principals kind of interacting and they're really separated. You can also see you've got a number of folks off to the side that are not engaging around these affective ties at all. Now, what's interesting to note here is that one of these nodes right here, this red one right here that connects the two of them, that individual retired. <laughs> and so when we look at the next year's data, we really, we really see the affective ties being really broken apart in this particular district. And remember, these affective trust ties are really important for the movement of evidence. We can also think about other kinds of ties that exist in districts, and this is a different district. Here, the same coloration is exactly the same. The red nodes represent central office actors. The blue nodes represent uh, the principals. You see on the left, time point one, on the right, time point two. And bear in mind, in the work that Karen and I do, we are committed to sharing this data back into the systems so that they're aware of the sets of relationships that exist and don't exist. Let's look at a different kind of relationship now, Carol, take us through. So as um, bridges are important geographically, they are also important in thinking about networks and the relationships people have, connectedness that they have. And so in a lot of places you find that uh, there are clusters of people who do connect, but they might not connect to each other. So the clusters are sort of each isolated. So I'm gonna show you a network map where we found this to be the case. This is in one of our districts and, and this is set up a little differently because in this district, leader, school leaders were grouped together into these clusters themselves. And so these are, the colored versions are the principal clusters and then the black are central office. And the reason why you see a black triangle is because there was a assistant superintendent who was meant to be the go-between between the, the principals and central office in these groups. So what, in terms of thinking about brokers or bridges, they're, they're the kind of people who connect the disconnected groups and their size, in this map, they're sized by playing that role. So if you are someone who tends to connect people who are disconnected, you have a larger triangle in this picture. And the triangle, I'm sorry, you have a larger node and mostly this maps with triangles in some of the clusters, but it doesn't in other clusters. And the reason why this is important is because the district actually thought that these leaders were playing that bridging role. And so you can see where sometimes the formal positions people play do not map onto the informal relationships that exist. Next slide. We also had, um, this sort of came up without us actually intending to look for it, but what we noticed over time as you try to trace patterns around relationships over time, we found that there was a great deal of churn in these systems, people moving in and out of the, of the schools and of central office. And so this is a map that helps to demonstrate the problems with un, unstable systems. Um, in this map, again, the nodes are sized by this bridging or brokering role that people play, connecting otherwise unconnected groups. And in this case, the key players are the ones who really hold the system together because they play this role more than anyone else. And the blue color nodes right now are the ones who left the system. So in, in the importance of this is that most of these key players, all but one, are someone who played such a big brokering role and then left the system. So you can see again how instability causes fragmentation and disrupts the networks around evidence use. Right. And so just in summary, the um, relationships matter to evidence uptake in terms of the connections individuals have with each other. And, and as I was suggesting, these strong, stable internal connections are critical. But we've also found, and this is in our most recent data that we're working on right now, that it's not just the individual connections around trust, but the climate of trust that supports the movement and uptake of evidence that's important. And finally, that the movement of evidence is highly reliant on these brokers who connect these otherwise unconnected groups. And so for all of you that were wise enough to join us today, here's some sort of large scale, high level takeaways from our work over the past five or six years. So we've got to help systems move beyond compliance to developing more capacity building at different levels of the system. 
we've got to really think about what are the policies and practices that incentivize collaborative work across different levels of the system to weave together the network to make it even stronger. We also have to be thoughtful around building the human capital around evidence interpretation and how we make sense out of it. This is also related to that idea about churn, is that while we're losing human capital knowledge, we're also losing social capital or the important set of those relationships. And then really what's really important here at the heart of this is this idea about social capital to really build the norms of reciprocal exchanges because those ties between and among us are going to be really important and that's where the heart of trust is built. And so with that we thank you and thank our fellow collaborators and the foundations for all their support and we'll turn it back over to our colleagues. Thank you so much Kara and Alan. Next up, we have Jamie Singer of RHEL Midwest, who's going to be talking to us about um, bringing these evidence-based practices into districts uh, through coaching. All right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we'll skip ahead there. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Singer um, with RHEL Midwest, and I am the among other things, the lead for all of our training, coaching, and technical support work. So I'm really excited to talk to all of you today um, about this important work and a little bit about some strategies for sharing um, evidence and data throughout systems. And I love, Alan and Kara, your image about the hippos dancing. I, I would like a printout of that slide on my wall, making the hippos dance. So we'll talk a little bit about that and hopefully ways that we can make sure that they don't lumber around with lots of data um, that isn't being used, but we have some sort of choreographed dance among them. Um, so we'll talk about some strategies that we can use, but first I want to take a step back and think about, and this kind of relates to what Alan and Kara were talking about too, ask a few questions um, of yourself before we start thinking through the actual strategies that you'll use. So first, we'll start with the what. So what are you trying to impart or communicate to people? Um, do you want to provide information to them about findings that you have from a research study? Do you want to share plans about collecting data that you're doing? So you want to start with that clearly defined plan um, to help determine the best way to actually communicate about it. So starting with that what is where you want to focus your attention at first. And then next up is the who. So who is your audience? And the more you can narrow down on your audience, um, the more effective your message will be. So throwing information out into the world and hoping that it sticks uh, is not the best way to go about thinking about these strategies to support evidence use. Uh, but starting by really sitting down, thinking about who are we trying to target and, and um, what's the best entry point to make sure that it is successful uh, when we are actually communicating with them? Which brings me to the third question, the why. So why are you communicating in this? What, why are you sharing that piece of information with that particular audience? Why is it important for them? And then so what? So if I'm your audience and you've shared information with me, I should have a clear idea of what I should do about it. So if you are sharing to impart knowledge, that's going to look very different from if you're sharing to persuade or sharing to help a stakeholder make a decision. So thinking about what it is that you want to share very specifically, who the audience is, why you're sharing it with that audience, and then what do you want them to eventually do about it. So with that in mind, um, I want to talk a little bit about this framework called the innovation decision process. So as you can see on the screen, um, the framework has five stages to the process. Knowledge, persuasion, decision, implementation, and confirmation. So when you're thinking about what you would like your stakeholders to achieve by share, sharing your research, sharing your evidence, sharing your data, this is a great place to start the conversation. So as I said previously, if you're interested in imparting knowledge to your audience, you're exposing them to evidence, which might look very different from if you're sharing research for decision making, which is also going to look very different from if you're sharing information to support implementation. And we'll talk through several examples um, to kind of get a sense of what those different things will look like. So we'll use this um, to 
frame how you want to accomplish success, basically, in sharing your different resources or in sharing your different pieces of information. So before we do that, though, I want to talk about the different ways that we can engage our audiences. And for the RELs, we break this down into four areas of training, coaching, tool development, and dissemination. So when we talk about training, we're talking about really building the technical and content knowledge of the audience. And this can be through a, a one-time training session or um, a series of sessions that takes place over a period of time, but you're basically imparting knowledge to your audience. For coaching, this is where you're working more closely with a specific group of people, a specific group of stakeholders, and you're really working deeply on a particular topic over um, perhaps a longer period of time, but really diving deep into that topic. For tool development, this inc could include developing things such as guides for explaining how to do something. Um, it could be a template or a tool for conducting research or for understanding and analyzing data. And then in terms of dissemination, you may include things such as blogs, newsletters, social media posts, public TV, or webinars like the one we're on right now. So how do you put all this together? So you want to take all the information that you brainstormed previously about your audience, what you want them to do with it, um, what sort of behavior change you want to see, combine that with the strategies and determine what makes the most sense. So we can think through this in terms of the um, five stages in the process and kind of think about, you know, if you um, have identified that you want to share information with a broad audience and your primary purpose is to increase their knowledge, then writing a blog post might be the best strategy. Whereas if you want to share evidence with an audience and have them actually implement something, you might need to do something more intensive, such as training, developing tools, or coaching. So for each of these stages, I'll share um, an example of how Realm Midwest has engaged our audiences. For um, when we want to share information, as I mentioned previously, with a large audience, and we're really trying to just impart knowledge, we're getting information out into the world, we might write a blog post. And there's an example of one that we did in April that focused on coordinating early childhood um, state data. So this will go out to our listserv, post on the website. Um, it might also be shared more directly with a stakeholder who's particularly interested in that topic. If we're focused on persuading an audience, and want to encourage their learning, then we might do a training session. And an example of this was with the Cleveland Partnership for English Learner Success. We facilitated a one-day research agenda setting workshop for the district staff. And this workshop really allowed the district staff to identify and prioritize their research topics, develop the research agenda, and put everything together into the research agenda. Um, so it was a one-day session helping them work through something that they would then interact with um, longer term. If we're trying to help stakeholders make a decision, we might present information in a checklist, such as the survey development guidance checklist. So using this checklist, this is something that stakeholders could use on their own. They can follow the steps within the checklist and um, figure out what will be on their survey and determine who the audience will be for the survey and how it will be disseminated. Uh, if we're trying to support implementation of evidence, we may engage in a coaching project. Again, this is really going deeper into a specific topic. Um, and as an example of this, we work with the Michigan Department of Education on a coaching project for organizational learning. Uh, the Michigan Department of Education right now is working to implement their top 10 in 10 years strategic plan. So RHEL Midwest is working with the deputy leadership team and other key stakeholders um, within the department to determine, to determine how best to use their data um, and evidence to ensure that they are achieving their plan. So this is an example of an exit ticket, and you can see there's a question on here that helps the staff really figure out if they're, how they're using data, reflecting on that, so provides them with some information about that, um, and then also gives the RHEL Midwest coach some information to help push the, the coaching participants forward and make sure that we're all on track for them achieving their goals. And finally, when we're intending to confirm and solidify a change in practice for our stakeholders, we may refer them to a clearinghouse. And so the panel that is going to come up and talk next is a great example of how we have worked with stakeholders 
to better understand the clearinghouses that exist and also how they align with the esoterics of evidence. Uh, so I will go ahead and turn it over to them. Thanks, Jamie. So up next, we have a panel discussion facilitated by Liz Davis of RAL Midwest and including Heather Bouton and Melissa Weber uh, Mayer. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so um, thanks for being here. I'm, I, I'm, I do not have control of, um, of the slides, um, so I'm just going to um, go ahead and, and ask. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn things over to Heather um, or Melissa um, to talk a little bit about the Striding Readers Grant. Oh, great. Yes. So, Ohio, we were we were lucky enough to secure one of the Striving Readers grants this past October. And um, just about a month ago, we awarded 46 subgrant awards. And this also includes 12 consortia who represent 112 districts um, within our state. And the, the grant breakdown is a it's a preschool through grade 12 grant and so part of the requirement was that the districts and leas and uh, early childhood entities applying had to identify evidence-based practices based on what their data was telling them and so they were searching for evidence-based practices from birth all the way to high school on how to raise literacy achievement so our grant breakdown looks like this um, represented on the screen here. We had 20 birth to age 5, 23 K to grade 5, 28 middle school, 26 high school, and it doesn't it doesn't quite you know add up to the number at the top because a lot of our grants spanned birth through grade 12 or birth through grade 5 or K through 8. Um, and we had um, a lot of discussions around how you look at your data. Uh, first and to identify what is needed and then how you would identify those evidence-based practices based on what your data is telling you. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, so I, I kind of already said these things here. <laughs> right, right. Um, what we did find was that um, this required a lot, a lot of hand-holding and a lot of um, explanation of different vocabulary terms, especially when we think about tiers of evidence. Um, most of our districts are used to using the word tiers as far as tiers of instruction, and so they kept getting confused by tiers of instruction versus tiers of evidence when considering the evidence-based practices that they had to provide. Right, okay, so next slide, please. So um, in December, then, uh, uh, Ron Midwest, uh, myself and um, David English, um, we led kind of a two-session uh, crash course um, on evidence um, based interventions for the ODE staff working on this project. And um, the first session provided an overview um, of the four levels of evidence defined by ESSA, which are strong, moderate, promising, and demonstrates the rationale. And I apologize um, if there's background noise because I'm in an airport right now, but I'll, I'll uh, mute when I'm not talking. So, um, so we applied the um, criteria that ESSA uses um, to determine the levels of evidence to the standards of existing research clearinghouses. Um, specifically, and the one that we kept, uh, had the, the most focus on was the What Works Clearinghouse, um, but there were other similar um, clearinghouses um, to basically to determine their uh, uh, intervention's level of effectiveness. Uh, next slide, please. So the coaching sessions um, resulted in a crosswalk tool um, that allows practitioners and policymakers to determine the asset tier of evidence achieved by specific intervention and outcome um, if it meets a particular uh, clearinghouse evidence standard, which uh, for what works clearinghouses meets standards with or without reservation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then we use that 
uh, crosswalk as a framework for several uh, resources that we developed um, for Ohio districts that we're applying for these Striving Reader subgrants. Um, the first was two workshop presentations that um, help the district understand the uh, uh, districts understand the as the tiers of evidence um, and how to navigate the What Works Clearinghouse to either find interventions that meet their needs um, or to verify what evidence tier a specific intervention uh, falls under if they have one in mind and they want to propose it um, in their application. Next slide. Um, so we also developed um, two step-by-step -step guides for districts. These really laid out the specific steps that uh, you need to align interventions and their outcomes listed on the What Works Clearinghouse uh, to the ESSA evidence tiers. Um, we developed guides for the Find What Works um, searchable database as well as um, for the What Works Clearinghouse practice guides. Um, and the materials um, we developed really have been in pretty high demand. Um, several other states, especially other striving readers states, um, have requested the materials. So because uh, the demand for these resources, uh, we're develop developing them for a broader audience, um, and they should be available on the RHEL Midwest website um, uh, in the next couple of months or so. Um, so that all I have, and um, I think we're going to turn it over to a panel discussion. Okay. So I have Heather and Melissa on with me. Um, and a question for them um, is first of all, um, how have the coaching sessions and materials? helped Ohio districts in their use of evidence and what worked about this approach? Um, in other words, in what ways did it help overcome common challenges in evidence use? Thank so you, Liz. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really very happy to be joining everyone on this panel. Um, and thank you to the previous presenters uh, for sharing such helpful information. Um, so as Liz said, she came to us with David in December to kind of kick off the work that we were doing around understanding the evidence-based requirements in ESSA. And um, although the question that Liz asked is around um, how did the resources they developed for us help our districts, I should note that in fact, part of the reason we reached out to the REL initially was because we as a state really felt the need to better understand the definitions of evidence-based strategies um, as laid out in ESSA. So we know that um, the concept of using evidence-based strategies is not particularly new, but the specific definitions laid out in ESSA are fairly new, and they raise the bar around using evidence-based strategies. So we really wanted to have a firm understanding of those definitions and the implications of the different tiers. And uh, as a state, because how can we provide support for our districts and address their questions if we ourselves um, don't fully grasp what we're working with? So Liz and David came in and helped us start thinking about the definitions, their meaning, their implications um, for policy and practice within districts. And um, as we were doing this and we started thinking about um, existing clearing houses, we started to recognize that all of us at the state and district level would really benefit from some additional resources um, to kind of help translate existing clearinghouses. Um, and, and part of the reason that Ohio, this was particularly important for Ohio was because through ESSA, we've committed to developing an Ohio evidence-based clearinghouse to support our district. And um, the intention here is not for us to recreate the wheel we know that there's a lot of really wonderful existing information out there in the existing clearinghouses. What we needed was some help in figuring out how to make the best use of that. And um, we did not want our district to have to go out there and figure that out uh, on a one-off basis, each one of them trying to figure this out on their own. Rather, uh, the work that the REL did for us helped us um, put together sort of common language, common understanding of definitions, 
um, and start to develop these step-by-step -step guides that we could then provide to our district to say, you know, you're not, we're not asking you to go out there and do this on your own. Here's some guidance and a starting point for you. Um, so our, sort of, we've been referring to our initiative here around evidence-based strategies as, as empowered by evidence. We want to empower all our districts to be able to go out there and, and take advantage of the research that can support their work. And so the resources that um, the REL developed for us are one step in that direction. So uh, Melissa, would you like to add anything to that? <laughs> Sure, I'll add just a bit, because I was thinking about when Jamie was talking about who who is your audience, and Heather mentioned uh, a little bit about that, and that our audience actually includes our state-level staff, and then we have regional arms that work directly with the districts, who would be our state support teams and our educational service centers, and then our, and then our local districts. And so when we think about our audience around evidence-based, um, what uh, they really liked was the crosswalk, as Liz said, and, and other states are asking for that. And we were kind of moved into high gear because of the Striving Readers Grant and our timeline for that grant application in order to provide some sort of assistance on, on how to identify these evidence base. And interestingly enough, it's a, it's a literacy grant and people got hung up on vocabulary. So, and defining these vocabulary terms, such as tiers, and as I mentioned before, tiers of instruction or tiers of evidence and understanding that, how that word works in different contexts. And then our other trip up word was, um, was the word intervention because as a practitioner listening to the language, they immediately went to um, uh, intervention as far as um, instruction and not intervention as far as an intervention as a research, a research piece. So we had some, we had some defining of terms to do both at the state well, all three at the state, the regional, and and the local levels, and we're still continuing to do that um, to the point where we we will not have people in in tears, the ones that fall down your face, which which we had because they were they were frustrated and trying to remember all of this, knowing they had a timeline that they were committed to to submit a driving readers grant, and they were worried that they would be dinged if they did not identify evidence based practices correctly. Um, so having said that, they were not, but now that we're going through and reading grants, what we're noticing is that they have identified strategies that do have evidence base behind them, but now we're finding that we have had uh, several, several of our awardees who have identified the same strategy, however, they've identified it as a different tier of evidence. So for example, let's say five of them identified vocabulary for K through five as their stra evidence-based strategy. One person said it was tier one, one person said it was tier two, one person said it was tier three, and two said it was tier four. So we're, so we're trying to help um, navigate those waters because what we want to be able to do as they move forward is to have them feel confident in identifying these evidence-based uh, strategies correctly. And one more thing I would add um, to to this is that the other benefit of having these definitions outlined the way they have been outlined and the crosswalks to the clearinghouses is that it helps, uh, I believe, that both the district and the state know what to ask for as we're engaging with research partners um, or working with vendors. Uh, it hopefully will give folks the um, information that they need to be asking the right questions around what's working or, or what the evidence is that something may work, or if they're developing a research um, project with someone, they this will give them the ability to ask the right questions, um, knowing that they need to be using evidence-based strategies for various purposes. What's, gonna, what's the research project that is gonna get them there? Excellent. Thank you so much for, for that information. I, I think you really did a great job um, um, talking about that process. I'm, I remember it fondly. <laughs> um, I really uh, loved working with these ladies. Um, so I actually need to turn um, things back to our, our um, moderator, and we're going to, um, I guess, take questions uh, from our, our audience. Thanks, Liz. So now we're going to open it up for a question and answer session, and we've already been getting a few questions in our chat box. We welcome you to add your questions into that box, and uh, we will read those out loud for our panelists. 
so one of the first questions that we got was uh, for Alan and Kara, and the question was, what are the implications of your research for state education agencies to build capacity at local education agencies for evidence diffusion and uptake? So do you, uh, I'll take the first part of it and then the other half of my brain can uh, take the other part and correct all the bad stuff I said. Um, so thanks for that question. Uh, I think a couple things come to mind for us. One is um, we're now in this time in which climate and culture are becoming important issues for us to consider and their connection to creating strong educational systems is really becoming much more uh, robust. So one of the first things we would say is to privilege the collection of some data around what's the collaborative climate, what, what are the sets of interactions that are at play in local LEAs as a way for them to truly understand the sets of um, the social capital exists or doesn't exist in the system and then using that as a jumping off point. Kara? I think the other thing I would add is the importance of focusing on leadership development in this area. So we just heard some examples around helping um, leaders and educators understand the more technical sides of evidence use. But as we talked about in our work, we find that there's both the technical side and the more emotional relational side. And so a lot of times um, we found in the districts we're in, they, they don't really set aside they might set aside the structure for collaborative work around, um, you know, learning what the evidence means and making uh, decisions about next steps and things like that, but they haven't built, as Alan's suggesting, those climates of trust, and that really takes a leadership role to have the structures aligned with the relationships and the organizational culture and climate. So I think there's a real opportunity through leadership development as an approach from state ed, too. Yeah, and finally on this note, I think the other thing is that we make a lot of assumptions that we say to people, uh, hey, you're all get together and collaborate, and then we walk away, or maybe we stay involved, and we assume that those complex set of skills that are necessary to collaborate, the facilitation, developing reciprocal relationships, allowing vulnerability to take place, are sort of skills that everyone just naturally has, but I think we have to be much more intentional about um, building capacity and developing those kinds of skills to be able to do this important work, as we heard from many of our colleagues on this panel. Thanks, Alan and Kara. I'm actually going to turn that same question over to our practitioners in Ohio, and I'm hoping that you all can um, answer the question as well. I'll repeat it. Um, so, what are some examples of policies or practices that you've used as a state education agency to um, incentivize the use of evidence uh, diffusion and uptake in between the state education agency and the local education agencies in your state? So certainly, uh, I mean, the Struggling Readers Grant is a good example of where we are um, encouraging the use of evidence-based strategies. And what I would say about that, uh, because that's not unusual, I mean, for the Striving Readers Grant program, but um, what I will say is one of the things that we did, and I don't know if other states did this or not, but we opened it up to evidence-based use along all four tiers of evidence. And so um, I want to draw particular attention to that last um, tier or level four which is known in law as the demonstrating a rationale, but um, we sometimes refer to it as kind of an innovation tier. And so this idea of kind of not just using evidence-based strategies, but also encouraging districts to contribute to the evidence base themselves um, and, and um, ideally kind of share that information out with their peers. Uh, we're pursuing developing peer-to-peer -peer networks um, so that districts can be working with each other and supporting each other around the use of evidence-based strategies. Um, and there are a number of other uh, areas where we're, you know, of course, specifically tying funds to the use of evidence-based strategies. I'll also note that um, this past year we started participating as a state in a program called Proving Ground. We have two pilot districts uh, working with Proving Ground. and. Um, 
they are they are working on strategies, developing strategies around reducing chronic absenteeism. And one of the requirements that we put in place for these two districts to participate and for them to receive some incentives to participate was that they serve as model districts um, or you know peer districts um, so that they can help build capacity uh, among their peers for doing this kind of work. Uh, so those are a few of the things that we're trying to do. And I think um, what we're really trying to do is help is it, we don't want this to just be the state coming out and saying to districts, you have to do this because it's in law you, and you need to do it and you need to check the box and be done. We really want to build up a culture where people start to understand the, the inherent value of using evidence-based strategies. And um, while we have a role in that, we also understand uh, that in many ways, districts collaborating amongst each other and being able to develop stronger community partnerships, research partnerships, may be a more effective way to kind of develop that capacity and develop that message. Melissa, would you, guys, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, uh, real quick, and thinking about incentivized use of, of evidence and even uptake, we have um, another effort that, that actually is tied to our striving readers, that's our state systemic improvement plan, where um, we have districts involved in um, not only identifying evidence-based practices, but in, in learning what those evidence-based practices are. And the uptake that we found is important is that we have included all of the educators that work with young children in preschool through grade three, including their administrators. So when I, when I think about the, um, the, the graphs that, um, that uh, Alan and Kara shared, it, it made me think of these groups of people that we've been working with and how they've been networking with their systems of leaders in order to understand evidence. And, and because they're seeing things change within their districts, they're actually talking about evidence-based versus research-based and even, even uh, using, using terms um, more frequently and more appropriately in their conversation. Thank you so much, Heather and Melissa. So another question from the audience relates to um, how we're defining evidence. One of our audience members asked whether, in particular, whether Ohio, when they were looking for evidence-based practices, whether they only looked in the What Works Clearinghouse or the WWC, um, and if so, why was that? Could you talk a little bit about um, why you relied on the What Works Clearinghouse and whether you used other definitions of evidence-based? Sure, just to clarify, so we have not to date created um, at the state level, created a list of evidence-based strategies to give to our districts to say these are the evidence-based strategies that you should be using. Um, that's not to say that that might not happen under certain circumstances in the future, but to date we have not created any sort of official vetted list. Um, and we also have not told districts that you can only use the What Works Clearinghouse. Rather, what we have been saying is um, because of the importance of local context and uh, because it's so important for districts to be able to sit down and really assess what's going to work best for them, uh, we're really encouraging, we, we want to start at least by giving them the tools to go out and find the evidence-based strategies that are going to work best for them. And those, they may find those through the What Works Clearinghouse, but they don't have to. There are many other clearinghouses that exist out there, um, and the materials that REL Midwest produce to the crosswalks actually do include several other clearinghouses, top tier evidence, uh, the blueprints for healthy youth are two of them. There are several more in that document. Um, and we basically said, you can use these, just understand that the, the definitions that are used by those clearinghouses don't align exactly to what ESSA defines for evidence-based strategies. So we're, um, we're giving you the tool to kind of do that alignment and you can go out and find using any clearinghouse you want to use uh, what's gonna work best for your district. Thanks, Heather. So we are drawing uh, to a close here. 
we are going to start wrapping up this webinar. Before we conclude today, I wanted to point out a few resources. We invite you to follow us on Twitter and visit our website for resources and news. You can follow us on Twitter at our handle at REL Midwest. And our web address is also listed there. Next slide. In addition, you'll find on this slide all of our email addresses in case you want to follow up with any individual panelists or with the panelists as a collective. We'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today to this webinar. I think this has been a very valuable uh, use of time. We've heard both from researchers who've done some really interesting work using social network analysis, We've heard from people who are out in the field providing coaching and training to state and local education agencies on how to use evidence. And we've also heard from one of the state education agencies in our region about how they are um, applying evidence within their state and thinking about the use of evidence. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists for participating in this webinar. And I'd also like to encourage all of our attendees to, um, to look, be on the lookout for the slides and the recording of this webinar. We'll be posting both the slides and the recording um, for anybody who did not get a chance to tune in live today, but would like to view these resources in the future. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.